Okay, Alternative Resiliency Services Corp, for those who are uh, new to uh, ARC. So next gen consultancy, that's the alternative to the legacy consultants in the space. We're a little different. So instead of a cover with an electron microscope picture of a virus or a scary shot of doctors with masks, we're giving you a puppy. Because who doesn't like puppies? Now, this could be contained and not spread globally, patterning the Ebola incidents of 2014 and 18, or it might pattern after the H1N1 pandemic of 2009. We have a couple of practitioners on the, uh, in the conversation, so I know you remember that. That was widespread, but not catastrophic. Uh, or it might be another Spanish flu 1917 with 500 million infections and over 50 million deaths. Uh, yes, even in today's uh, environment. So yes, we do have better technology now, and better healthcare, but it's become a much smaller planet with global travel and diversity, and you do not want to be playing catch up with this one. So let's have a conversation, very brief and to the point, about the practicalities of pandemic planning to give you the tools, approaches, and information to get started. Okay, so uh, quick glance at the numbers. These are from early this morning. Uh, you can see that we have so far a little south of 100,000 confirmed cases of uh, novel coronavirus. Of those, 48,000 have been, uh, have recovered, and we have 3,000 deaths. So if you look at the numbers, we have a little bit better, maybe that's not the word, but a little bit higher than 2% mortality, which is above normal flu. So this disease, if you get, if you, um, contract it, it's not necessarily as bad symptomatically as flu. And as somebody who just came out of a, a bout of influenza one last month, uh, I can tell you flu is not fun. Uh, but this one, uh, you do have a 2% or better chance of mortality. Now, I don't believe these figures, uh, I don't take them at face value. I do not believe the figures that are coming out of Asia. I think that's being drastically underreported for a number of reasons. And healthcare being very variable among countries, healthcare in um, uh, say Sweden or Switzerland or the United States being better than uh, some other countries might be, the mortality rate is going to fluctuate. But you can see we have some averages. Total countries reporting uh, one or more cases, 78, uh, more than 50 cases, 15. So it is starting to spread. So that's the numbers. Let's not spend a whole lot of time about the numbers. This conversation is not going to be about the structure and all the accoutrements of the virus. It's not a medical discussion. I am not a doctor. This is also not going to be about the structure and all the accoutrements of a pandemic plan. All the chapters defining the mission and documenting scope and the chapter about what coronavirus is and all the meta information. You've all seen the 500 page binders that sit on the shelf. Alternative Resiliency does not do binders. Uh, we do pragmatic and practical. So this conversation is going to focus on the pragmatic and practical. The agenda is in front of you. We'll cover these four items and we'll have hopefully time for some questions. Uh, I do have a hard stop at one o'clock. I'm sure some of you do as well. So uh, let's uh, respect uh, everybody's time here. Okay, so business continuity planning Many companies have a business continuity plan, although you'd be surprised at how many don't. And some companies, some organizations do have a pandemic plan. These are not necessarily interchangeable. Business continuity does not completely cover pandemic or vice versa. They do have some commonalities. They must be plug compatible, but because they are different, they should have different frameworks. Business continuity does not typically address things like reduced demand for products, reduced demand for services, uh, other strategic issues. And um, pandemic plan doesn't necessarily, or, or it shouldn't, address things like technology outage or, uh, you know, terrorism or, you know, fires, floods, that kind of a thing. So you can see the differences up on the screen. Uh, business, I'm, I'm not going to read these to you because I'm assuming that if you're on this conversation, you know how to read. So looking at business continuity, that's the focus. Heavy on response, and yes, there is some preparedness, of course. Pandemic is a little bit different. 
but they do have some overlap in, in the sense that they both contemplate facility closures, operating under mass staff absence, contingency mod operations, supply chain outage, and uh, oftentimes succession on, on an executive level. So one of the other differences is that business continuity plans cut across the business, but most are location centric. Bad things happen to locations with assets or people or technology. Pandemic plans cut across the business on a much broader level. So if you have both, then that's great. If you have business continuity, you could add on with pandemic, but those are things to think about. Now, I'm sure you've all seen the email that HR has sent through your enterprises. Dear people who work here, coronaviruses in the news, you can stay home if you want, try not to travel, wash your hands, we're doing everything possible, keep calm, you're important, love HR. That's a good thing. It kind of covers HR's um, liability and organization's liability. Not so much helpful. I mean, I learned most of this uh, at my mama's knee when I was 10, but it's, a, it's, not, it's an important step. I'm not trying to minimize it, but this is not a plan. This is step 11 out of a 100-step plan. Pandemic impacts are much broader than employees might get sick, and email is not a plan. So we're going to unpeel this a little bit more, and, um, and you'll see what I mean. So there's a lot of panic going on, and some are suggesting that this is overblown. Both sides are wrong. My prediction is that it will get worse, it will linger longer, this is all fast breaking, we don't know enough yet, and it's changing. But on the business side, we can be confident that there will be loss of confidence, that will, there'll be loss of decre or decreased demand for products and services, there'll be less in travel and hospitality, and hits on culture and entertainment. I had the pleasure and privilege of going to Anchorage, Alaska last week to present at a conference there. The airport was eerily empty, and my line at TSA took 30 seconds to go through. And the screeners were not happy that they had to show up to work. So this is, this is real, and it's becoming tangible. This is going to result in a lot of other knockoff benefits. I mean, you can see the, uh, the business impacts. Think about factory closures. Think of disruptions in supply chain. And think of other collateral damage. Now, maybe this is overblown. Maybe people are overreacting. But... This is super important. Whether the business impacts are from the virus or whether they're from people's panic, there's still business impacts and they still have to be dealt with. So it's not so much are we panicking or not, it's what do we plan for and how do we keep our organizations resilient. Okay, so here are the issues. There's, there's a lot more than just washing your hands. And it's a lot more than everybody can work from home because they can't. Many people can't work from home. Think about your organization. Do you have people using high-end desktops for running mathematical models? Do you have people producing code and other compute intensive work that you can't do on your tablet? Do you have people handling materials? Do you have people handling cash uh, during a pandemic? Do you have people building things? Is your organization, um, not just a knowledge organization or on the internet. Also, there's a huge difference between people occasionally taking a work from home soccer mom or soccer dad day versus the entire organization is socially distancing and operating under duress. Everybody thinks, well, I can work from home. I worked from home last, last Thursday. So everybody else could just do the same. You working from home on Thursday is very different from your entire organization being dispersed. I have an hour long video on the operational risks of work from home on Bright Talk. You can go look it up. Let's go to tactics and let's roll forward. So we talked about social distancing and work from home. Contact tracing. Uh, this is kind of super important. It's one thing when Bob or Kim are infected, they'll stay home or if they get the sniffles, they'll prophylactically socially distance themselves. But what about the cubicle mates? What about the other 10 people in yesterday's workshop that they intended? That's contact tracing. And be advised that the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about Corona is that 
you can pass it and be contagious when you're asymptomatic before. You can pass it and be contagious when you're asymptomatic after. So if Bob and Kim have uh, fever for a week and they come back into the office the next day, they might still be contagious. So what do you do about all the people that, are, that they're interacting with? Um, how do you trace them? And what do you do? Do you scan people's calendars? Is this kind of an IT project to figure this out? And what do you tell their contacts? And how do you do that while respecting Bob and Kim's privacy? Do you go to people and say, hey, you were in a workshop with somebody who had coronavirus. Uh, you should stay home for two weeks. These are thorny, thorny issues. So facilities issues, that's another item, but it's oftentimes a lot more complicated than people think. I can walk into your facility and I promise you I can find over a dozen infection vectors over and above the dozen that you'll identify. You might also want to consider a vendor for wipe down of the conference room where Bob and Kim had their workshop. Um, there's a host of prophylactic measures you can consider, everything from what's happening in the coffee room to what's happening at the print stations to what's happening at reception. And there's a lot to think about when you're, when you're going through the facilities quarantine and sanitizing uh, protocols. Self-reporting, another one. Uh, so you have staff absences. How do you know if they're for sickness or if they're just soccer mom or soccer dad? Bob, stay, Bob tells his manager, I'm working from home for two days. Does he disclose uh, why? Does he say because I have the flu? Does he say because I have corona? What about the social stigma there? How do you know if there's a corona threat? Is there a structural way to do this? Does your company have the flu reporting at yourenterprise.com email alias set up? Reporting and monitoring. How do you capture and organize all the information that you need to in order to manage the impacts on your staff and your business? What elements do you share with, with and with whom? Legal might want to weigh in on some of the data privacy issues here. So it's not just, this is not just HR sending a, an email. I hope we can agree. Travel limiting, it's more than just China. It has every potential to get worse, but do you pull the moat up around your building, around your business and say, nobody's traveling anywhere? A lot of companies are starting to do that. That's going to have a lot of knockoff effects. Is that really necessary? You have to approach this with a little bit of pragmatism. Essential staff identification and care, let's talk about that. One element of a plan that I've developed uh, involved every business area identifying the small handful of indispensable people. Now that's not to say that you're critical and the person next to you is not. That's not to say that you're more important. It's to say what are the small handful of people that we really, really don't want to get sick for business reasons, not just for HR empathetic reasons. And then it's up to the enterprise to figure out what to do. Some tactics uh, might involve distributing meds to those tier two people. So oseltamivir or Tamiflu in the case of H1N1, uh, we don't have a medicine for Corona yet. Uh, what about distributing to the family members of the tier one people like execs? Are you going to uh, contemplate giving your CEO uh, courses of medication that you won't give the VPs or, you know, how do you handle that? Now, I'm not recommending oseltamivir. Again, I am not a doctor, but I'm aware that these issues are out there and I'm aware of some of the ramifications of the decisions that you might make. I know that a lot of pharma companies are fast tracking research on this, but I'm not aware that a cure or a preventive has been discovered that might take months and then there'll be contraindications and allergic reactions and all that. We'll have to work through all that. Uh, there's also a distinction between what the government can do and what your org can do. And things like quarantine, et cetera. It's important when you're contemplating a pandemic plan for your organization, sometimes there's, a, there's a, um, a tendency to get pulled into these other areas and organizations and the private sector really have to stay in their lanes on this one. I hope that I'm not going too quickly. Again, this will be on demand so you can rewind and listen to me as much as you want. So, facilities issues. Facilities should be worrying about spread limiting, sanitation, workspace quarantine, cleanup and signage. HR issues. The policies for sickness or absence, policies for paying people during corona if the uh, organization is closed, policies for reporting instances, including respecting employee privacy, 
There might be possible EAP issues, uh, travel, care, succession and delegation of authority. That's something that a lot of organizations don't do. And bear in mind, while it's uh, children and seniors being more at risk, so it might not impact employees directly, your org might suffer mass staff outages to, to have employees caring for loved ones. So staff outages, mass um, absence can occur for a number of different reasons. So let's talk about IT, developing systems to gather and report your intel, developing systems for getting content into the company newsletter or internal website or wiki, so people are aware of uh, the situation, what, what is expected of them. Um, legal issues, ensuring a standard of due care, that's super important for uh, during the class action suit when you go into court and you say, Your Honor, yes, we did have a pandemic plan, it was an actual pandemic plan, and we did have some hiccups, rather than going into court on the, uh, you know, for the class action suit for whatever reason, and saying, Your Honor, we thought everybody could work from home and HR sent an email, so we're good. Uh, no, you're not. So legal, a lot of illegal issues. Business issues. The business side has to be involved in your pandemic planning because it's not just facilities and HR, right? I mean, I, I hope we're, we're past that by now. Uh, the business issues are all about supply chain disruption, contingency mod operations with reduced staff, reduced supply of materials, uh, raw materials, for example, uh, reduced supply of services, logistical issues, information sharing, strategic issues such as revenue impacts uh, from reduced demand. What about currency issues or inflation or recession? There's going to be global impacts for this. We've already started to see that. Yes, I did touch my face and I promised to wash my hands afterwards. Uh, PR communications issues. Uh, who would have thought that pandemic is a PR or communication issue? What about news monitoring? including social media. What about intel gathering and synthesis? Who's going to do that? People that understand communications. Um, communications can push or pull information to customers, vendors, suppliers, parties of interest, your internal comms or your PR department. They're going to be uh, focused or they should be focused on uh, what's going on with pandemic in your company so that they can talk about um, reputation management and they can manage the issues around, oh my gosh, I, I saw on Twitter that employees of Acme Widget Company have coronavirus, uh, the company's going to go out of business. And that's, that's not exaggeration. You, uh, you all know what social media can do nowadays. Okay, so that's kind of where, where we are and what to think about. So what do you do? Here's the free consulting on what you can start doing to develop your pl pandemic plan. This is one approach, there are many. One way to get started is to workshop getting all the things that you need to do, tactics and elements of a plan, get a matrix, show it up on the board, get the right people in the room, and start listing out vertically in column one all the things you should do. There's self-reporting, there's signage, there's all the things that we talked about. And then across the, t across the top, uh, define columns for every uh, piece of the organization. And then you can start filling in. It's almost kind of like a racy chart, right? So you can see that for self-reporting, there are things that HR need to contribute. This thing, there are things that IT has to contribute, marketing, legal, et cetera. For signage, same thing. And all of the other items that we talked about before, lay those out in column one and start fleshing them out to see what has to be done. Now, there'll be a lot more columns and many, many more rows, but this is kind of the framework that you can use. Once you get this fleshed out, a good project manager can convert these into work, stream, uh, work streams, track these to completion and to implementation of deployment. And so you could start with this way of uh, comprehensively thinking about all the elements and then drive this into projects. Um, your in-house business continuity or consultants can supply expertise, uh, intel, best practices, and help kind of pull it together to make sure that it'll actually work. And then at the end of the day, each business area, uh, not all, uh, all of these, but each business area to product management, um, uh, internal audit, development, et cetera, sales, uh, will have a template or should have a template 
that they could fill out that says, here's what we're doing to prepare, and here's what we'll do to respond. And then the pandemic task force, we'll talk about that in a second, can, um, can track readiness of, uh, of the organization by area. So here's the way to think about that. One way to think about pandemic planning and tracking is reporting and dashboarding. So here's one example. Color coding can be, kind of, can be applied to uh, business area, location, or both. It can be another slice. That can, this can also be applied to, uh, can it be applied to suppliers, to vendors, to service providers, and you can track your preparation and your degree of response required. So there's kind of a heat map from nothing done, condition white, to preparation is complete, condition blue, and then hopefully in a short amount of time, all of your areas and all of your supply will be in um, condition blue, and then condition green, business as usual, then it moves up, you have uh, an outbreak, maybe take some stops, spot measures, uh, you might have multiple outbreaks in a business or in a location, it's time to take prophylactic measures, and when you exceed, uh, reach or exceed a threshold close facility. These thresholds should be predefined so you're not thinking or kind of trying to make it up subjectively on the day. So using thresholds also helps manage the cost of executing, because if you think, you don't have to do everything right out of the gate in terms of locking down your business to make it flu resistant or corona resistant. Um, you scale up or down your responses by area to be most effective with the, mean, with the most cost effectiveness. So let's talk about governance a little bit. So pandemic plas task force, pandemic task force. Proper practice will be to convene a task force around this, uh, around this challenge. It should be multidisciplinary, like you saw before. It's not just HR and facilities. It should have a senior leader spearheading this, and it should have full visibility to the executive committee or the board, and not just to delegate down, give it to some VP who's going to give it to some director who's going to give it to some manager who has nobody left to give it to. That's how most committees are formed of your business, right? Best practice would be that this task force use the normal governance structures for your organization so it gets baked into the organization's DNA. And it's not just this kind of group on the side that may or may not even have any teeth. Put it into how your company is run. How your company is run should be to manage pandemics such as coronavirus. And yes, coronavirus is not officially a pandemic yet. Stay tuned. Okay, there's a number of housekeeping items that can really add value to your efforts once the situation is passed. Once you return to normal, you should think about rewinding the plan. How do you control Z your plan? Uh, a checklist for undoing any steps taken during the situation. This is a very often neglected part of business continuity planning in general. I'm aware of a name brand global leader in their space that suffered a complete data center outage, which is kind of a long story, happy to have it offline. And they could have evoked that disaster recovery, but they did not. And they elected to suffer through kind of bringing it back to uh, production, which took over a day. Now, why did they do that? They had no confidence in their ability to return home and fail back to production. They didn't have a back to normal plan. A rewind plan helps to ensure that extra costs are turned off and nothing falls through the cracks. Documenting. There might be some preservation or archiving to consider. Uh, the decisions made, the actions taken, et cetera, might be for legal or insurance purposes, get your legal folks to weigh in. And whether something is privileged or not, attorney-client privilege, ACP is a, is a topic in and of itself that people could talk for hours about, so it's not that simple. And feedback, uh, consider conducting a hot wash or a post-mortem on a situation, and I will bet you that there will be lots of lessons learned Lots of improvement opportunities, and not just for the next pandemic 10 years from now, but I, I am confident that when properly facilitated, feedback will yield um, good things to do for daily operations. So think about after the fact, before the fact. Interesting that this organization found it so important to exercise that they brought the actor Vin Diesel 
into uh, participating in exercise. No plan should exist without trying it out first. Leading teams, especially the pandemic task force or plan owners through a pandemic scenario can help them immensely. You'll find gaps and disconnects from your planning. You can fix them beforehand. You will expose people to how the plan works and you'll take it from paper to practice. You'll give them a valuable training and leadership development opportunity. How do you keep cool under fire? How do you think two moves ahead? How do you think around corners? How do you move with fuzzy, fast-breaking information that might change tomorrow? How do you not be the deer in the headlights? Those are the values of exercise, not just to make sure that the plans don't contain typos. You'll give the people, like people in this room, uh, confidence and competence so that they won't be those, deers in, uh, those deer in the headlights. That's kind of rounding third base. Let's go through a couple of final thoughts. Masks. Masks are getting really popular. They're also getting really out of control. When I was a CTAC, I mentioned, I saw workers wearing masks that they got from Home Depot uh, to, in the drywall department. That's, that's not going to help anything. My own opinion is the opinion of CDC and World Health Organization is that they might slow the spread when worn by an infected person. They might protect an uninfected person who is a first responder or working around people that are high risk. But if you're not like somebody working in a hospital and just somebody walking around, it's going to have minimal value in prevention for a number of reasons. And uh, like I said, time is not our friend. A much better, better value is frequent washing of hands for at least 10 seconds. That's two stanzas of happy birthday to you. Or for the Catholics, that's one Hail Mary, which uh, couldn't hurt any case. So medicines, as I mentioned before, they're working on them. Uh, this is going to take some time. There's issues of side effects, contraindications, which will probably be rushed through and we'll clean up that mess later on. Um, as I said, also Tamivir is not indicated for coronavirus to my knowledge, but it can be effective against other strains. Um, the same thing with the standard flu shot of limited value, especially for coronavirus, but 25% effectiveness for a normal flu is a lot better than zero. And again, just to put this into perspective, we saw the numbers before, normal flu like influenza A infects millions of people every year and deaths in the United States uh, number tens of thousands. We're not there yet with coronavirus. Let's uh, hope and pray that we don't get there. And again, I'm not a doctor. Competitive advantage, just think about this. Letting your customers know that your organization has a plan in place and that you'll be there no matter what can yield significant competitive advantage. Trust me when I say that there are name brands out there that do not have a pandemic plan and that they think they've covered ba their bases with the global HR memo to people saying, flu is bad, wash your hands, we think you're important, love HR. Um, don't be that org. Get a plan and crawl about it and make sure that your customers know that you and not your competitors are on top of the situation. Uh, that can yield significant top line improvement in this situation. Financial impacts, kind of the flip side. This cannot be underemphasized. Now, whether it's from panic or whether it's real or, or whatever the reason, these are very important considerations. So think about loss of revenue, currency inflation, recession, loss of competitive position if mass ap staff absences cause you to slip a product or service release or impact service levels. If your organization is significantly impacted and you're a public company, this might be a material impact for reporting. It's a lot more than people might get sick, right? And finally, fairness and scope. Issues around treating essential personnel differently. Issues around balancing scope. How much do you do in terms of advising employees on their personal preparedness, like stockpiling food and water so they don't have to get out? This is a balancing act, right? And it takes both empathy, empathy and hard-headed hard -headed pragmatism. That's all I had. I'm confident that this has provided some practical takeaways and you can get things to, to think about. I'd be, risk, I'd be remiss as a consultant if I did not offer to assisting in, de in developing a leading practice on non-legacy pandemic plan for your org or if you have one or developing one, offer my expertise and uh, assessment of your efforts and asset value. But again, this is just a conversation. 
So my contact information is here. You know where to find me. Thanks. Stay safe. I really appreciate your joining me in the conversation. And um, we will meet again. Take care.